Well, it's great to be here. Um, again, it's, I'm really happy that EGA has uh, given me this opportunity to be here today. It's nice to see you all here. I've just arrived on a, from a long, dusty road. Um, the image that you see on the screen uh, is, in fact, from a marine biology interpretation of chemical signaling at different levels, uh, different scales between organisms in the ocean. The theme, I, I live in Townsville, which is uh, uh, sort of marine biology capital of the, of the world, possibly. So I've sort of fused a picture of a, of a shaman who, with whom I lived for a couple of years, with, uh, with whom much of my uh, research has been based. And uh, he's got feelers out into the world. Title of the paper is Chemicals, Not Symbols. It's a critique of, uh, and I'm presenting my interpretation of how shamanism among an ethnic group in Venezuela might work as a healthcare system. This comes from my own dissatisfaction with reading anthropological analyses of shamanism. And so I begin from these opening questions. What if Pieroa shamans really do as they say they do, which is communicate with spirits to negotiate health that is primarily human health outcomes? The larger question, what if people can change distant matter, this is the nature of the game, to harm or to heal? And what if this process is not dependent on belief, which has been a primary assumption of anthropological and psychiatric interpretations of shamanic healing. So then, what is the nature of this communication? What is the medium of information flows? <clears throat> and what is the mechanism of healing or health promotion? So this talk addresses two questions primarily. What's the nature of shamanic information and communication? And my hypothesis, in case, in case it doesn't become clear at any other stage in my talk, is that chemical signaling is either a more apt way of understanding it than is symbolic healing, or in fact, Piroa shamans are using their consciousness to reflect back upon chemical information flows that exist in their environment. This comes from uh, observations and studies in a range of fields where chemical signaling is the common means of communication both within and among organisms. And it comes from the observation, and I'll go through this, that Piero shamans are primarily concerned with communicating not with other humans in the interest of healing humans. That is, they're communicating with spirits who take animal shape, and they do so by means of manipulating chemical flows. And I finish with a couple of alternative or compatible lines of analysis which I haven't fully integrated with a chemical ecology framework, but which uh, I, I believe are compatible. And uh, they are arising as we witness a shift to back to something like social frames of consciousness from uh, a 20th century, which uh, was dominated by behaviorism and materialism. And that's how I'll conclude with a bunch of questions. But this begins with, uh, yeah, my dissatisfaction with anthropological critiques, that's the background I come from, which is obsessed with symbols and uh, obsessive supernatural disorder. <laughs> A disorder experienced by many humans throughout much of their life, the unshakable pursuit of tales and one's own tale whereby symbols separate humans from other animals and gods and allow anthropologists to obsess about how we create them, symbols, meanings, bodies, and environments. 
And there's a quote there which summarizes this distinction between humans and other animals. The point is that this way of thinking that humans are particularly special prevents understanding of a great many human domains of behavior. These are some baseline definitions, so you know what I mean by the terms that I use. Shaman is a person who uses information derived from culturally valued altered states of consciousness frequently conceived of in terms of spirit communication for a social end resulting in movements toward health or illness. Once again, these would be culturally understood concepts, the health and the illness bit a master of mind and minds. I skirt the definition of mind and I simply provide from Bateson, Gregory Bateson's concept of mind, which is a thing in an adaptive environment, therefore it's a property of nature. And information, once again from Bateson, a difference that makes a difference. Communication, the transmission of information, these are the, the these are the, uh, the processes I'm looking at. So my analysis derives from my field work in Venezuela with the Piroa ethnic group who inhabit an area illuminated in green on the map. There are about 12,000 Piroa people. They live in highland uh, uh, inter river zones in the Guiana Shield up to an elevation of about 2,500 meters as well as lowland uh, Orinoco plains going over into Colombia. They're Sweden horticulturalists who hunt and fish <coughs> and make a lot of food, a lot of vegetable food. This is the family I lived with for a year and a half. This is going back seven years ago now. Jose Luis Diaz and his wife and two of his children. And on the left, Jose Luis Jr. and their, and his, uh, their eldest daughter, Saheru, in front of their house. There has been one main line of interpretation for how shamans are able to heal. This we can summarize as symbolic healing. And symbolic healing is basically assuming there is a one-to-one -one relationship between a patient and a healer, and the mechanism of healing is negotiated in that one-to-one -one relationship. It emerged from studies by Claude Lévy-Strauss, which drew on psychoanalysis in the 1960s and since has dominated anthropological analyses of shamanic healing. They've also been integrated into various uh, new order uh, forms of shamanism. The basic idea is that stories can rearrange feelings, symbols are attached to emotions which can be moved around to assist someone to make better sense of their existence and therefore to heal, to make more whole their sense of self. There are, there's an important assumption here which is that the healer and the patient must exist in a, in a a similar symbolic realm for the symbols that the shaman is manipulating to be understood by the patient who's interpreting them. The second thing is that the patient themselves must believe. They actually have to think that what the healer is doing might heal them. This form of healing, the, this way of understanding shamanic healthcare or healing, which is really a derivative of psychoanalysis and psychotherapy, Western concepts of psychotherapy, which are about one-to-one -one relationships between patients and healers, has been elaborated 
and at its most biocultural level can be understood as a control system whereby molecules, organs, a whole body, and then a group, and emotions are a transactional media which move between these levels of a control system. And it's the performance of myth and myth and ritual in this context which enable the mobilization of, of emotions to rearrange people's sense of self. The point is, if you look at this at a meta level, you could say that what is being rearranged here are uh, feelings, but that the locus of this feeling and the healer is working as a sort of climate change of emotional radiance, but they're working at a one-to-one -one level. My basic premise is that this does not explain most of what's going on in my experience of Amazonian shamanism. This is clim cosmic climatology from, from the bottom up. This assumes that the nature of healing is about putting out fires as they emerge, that is, someone is sick and you heal them. What I understand the Pieroa shamanic system, how it works, is quite the opposite. It is about raining down to prevent fire in the first place. It's about health care, and if you have to get to the point of fire, you've already lost the game, and you're not much good as a healer. Or I should say, healer is probably not the right word. It's a, a maintainer of health. In the framework of the Pieroa shamanic system, the concept of health care, healing, that is, all of the rituals that form what has been celebrated in the literature as the basis of healing, make up a very small part of what goes on. In fact, communication with humans, and we can assume that a patient and a healer are communicating as two humans in a language that might be understood by humans, makes up a very small part of what's going on. Therefore, the, the, the nature of the communication needs to be understood, and this is what I'm trying to come to terms with. And then the nature of the information that is considered significant in order to maintain health must be understood. And this is not reducible to symbols. It's a logic, in fact, that's not reducible to one-on-one. -on -one, or psychology as it's understood as something which exists within a body. Or consciousness which exists within a body. That is a, a, a bit of flesh that you carry around, it's a, it's a population health approach. And therefore, we need a, an approach to understanding what's going on here, which is working at the population level. So I would say that the primary way, in fact, that a Piero as shaman works is neither psychological nor social, although it affects both of these things. I have a bunch of words up here on the screen. These are, all <laughs> these are all problems with the framework that I've tried to, to sketch about symbolic healing. The basic problem with symbolic healing as an explanation for shamanic healthcare, as I understand it in this ethnic group, and I suspect it is probably true of other Amazonian ethnic groups, is that the primary information that is communicated is not symbolic. It's not happening in words. Secondly, it's preventative rather than curative. And understanding how to prevent illness at a population level cannot be reduced to psychotherapeutic levels of analysis. So it's not about using metaphors, symbols, and narratives to change bodies by changing minds. In fact, the participation of the, the so-called patients is not even required. 
It's predicated on an approach to understanding human health that not only transcends humans, but in which humans are relatively insignificant players. And in order for humans to stay healthy, shamans must collectively bargain with spirits and animals by way of plants. Most importantly, for this system to work, according to the people I worked with, the people they're preventing help for don't have to believe in the system at all. So this all exists in a framework and by way of introduction to the cosmology of the Piro ethnic group, whereby hallucinogens brought the gods and people into the world. The first god was a snake. He ate a plant probably a Malouetia species, began containing plant. In the pulp of that plant grew the first set of twins, two deer, a male and a female, who became the progenitors of much Pieroa knowledge. Drugs precede thought in Pieroa mythology. All of the creations of the world were brought in as gods dreamed them and created them. Unfortunately, while they were experimenting with the hallucinogens, that was Yopo and Kapi, Banisteriopsis, Kapi, and Anadinotherus snuff, the gods got into all sorts of trouble. <laughs> their egos went to their heads. They realized they could create everything. They thought they were the masters of the universe. And they ended up getting into all sorts of trouble. This is the primary materia medica. They chew capi, large quantities of it. It's very strong. It's very good. They also make beverages. And they drink that before snorting Yopo. It's a very much a Yopo-centered ethnic group, as many of the ethnic groups in the, in the uh, mid to upper Orinoco are. This is uh, Jose Luis making some Yopo. It's a very involved process. Some of you here have probably tried to make Yopo yourselves. I hope that went well for you. <laughs> and uh, this is a classic, uh, a classic sequence of shots depicting Jose Luis post-inhalation. Snorting and then immediately rubbing his head. Uh, you got a bit of uh, sort of constriction, blood, a bit of pain immediately. He didn't vomit. I vomited a fair bit there. <laughs> then I stopped that after a while. <laughs> the thought it was better not to eat. <laughs> so these are the, the Wahadi was one of the two, right, sorry, deer. It was Wahadi, Wahadi was a top here. Uh, these are the two gods who discovered the use of Yopo uh, and brought all of the technologies that the PRO are now avail themselves of into being through visions attained during Yopo consumption. Now each of them wanted to be the big man, the most powerful man in the universe, the most powerful shaman. One was a jaguar, one was a tapir. The tapir was a sort of bumbling fool. He wasn't evil. But he, uh, he was greedy, and the Yopo would uh, create in him also his downfall. He had a very large penis. <laughs> and uh, after creating things of great potency, uh, he used to like to seduce women, and he ended up seducing a bunch of governor's daughters, Venezuelan colonial governor's daughters, and he ended up his life in a prison, uh, and he lost all his powers there. Uh, but before that, he managed to kill uh, Quemoy, the jaguar. Uh, Quemoy was off in the forest. He developed all the hunting technologies, poisons, uh, and he, was, uh, he had an incestuous relationship with his daughter, uh, which is, uh, once again, a result of the uh, dark side of hallucinogens having sway and an inability of both of these creator gods to gain mastery over the power that they discovered and tried to wield. 
And therefore, the PRO cosmology is defined by the reality that you cannot, there's no recourse to the models of your gods who created the world you live in. They were fallible. In fact, they failed. And the best you can do as a human as lear is learn from their mistakes. And that is what the shaman tries to do in an ongoing balance of very difficult powers derived from Yofo and Kapi intoxication. Now, going into the, into the chemical ecology, the, the idea, and there's a mechanistic analysis of Amazonian uh, mythology, it goes like this, but this is from Rachel Dolmatov, who's also, uh, in terms of ethnography in the Amazon, provided the best analysis of, certainly of, of ayahuasca use among the Tucano. Uh, whereby the, the, mytho the mythological system is interpreted as a means of uh, balancing human needs with the natural resource capacities of the space that the humans inhabit. And it's very easy to make the same interpretation uh, for Pieroa uh, mythology. Uh, illness derived basically when Wahadi had a feast uh, he invited all the animals. All the animals had musical instruments, their own technologies, their own culture. They had their songs. He invited them all to a banquet, and then he took it all from them. He was at the head of the table, and he takes it all from, from the other animals. The other animals are going, whoa. Then those animals become animals and not transformable into humans, and it changed the shape of the world. The animals got back and said, right, Wahadi, well, we, we, like we know you like this species, the humans. We are going to infect them with disease every time they eat us. And uh, this results in a, uh, a, a, a theory of illness, uh, whereby the severity of illness, uh, one could say, is linked to the size of the animal uh, or its ecological footprint. The bigger the animal, the bigger the disease. And what the shaman tries to do constantly is sing into uh, sing to appease, negotiate with spirits who represent the interests of animals, as well as plants. But the animals uh, have a special place here. They're singing to negotiate. <coughs> and in this framework, uh, the only person who can represent the interests of humans in this realm, is a non-material realm, is the shaman. And all the power and all the knowledge exists in an immaterial world whereby there are many other powerful players of which the representatives of the animals uh, are very significant. So you sing to communicate with spirits who aren't animals, but who represent animals. But the singing is, uh, it's not in a language, it's not in Pieroa. It's not in a language that anyone else understands. Now, my interpretation of spirits is a little uh, unsatisfying, I think. Uh, Spirits are hard to grasp uh, with materialist scientific explanations. I'm trying to get as close as I can with a framework, chemical ecology, which is in many ways highly immaterial and corresponds to the ecological logic of Piro healthcare. In which case, you've got a bunch of alchemical reactions happening in people's heads people's bodies produce a bunch of experiences. But the spirits themselves are not only individuals because you're negotiating with people who represent the interests of populations in the same way that your work is concerned with representing the interests of populations, and mostly human populations. Bioregional animism. So... Uh, chemicals thing. I got a bunch of pictures here uh, which look to me very similar to Yopo imagery. Uh, 
this is based on my own experiences and own experiences that I discussed at length with Jose Luis over two years and about 200 Yopo sessions in trying to understand the nature of the language which is the nature of the art which these guys pursue every two days throughout their lives. And it's something which, uh, yeah, I'm trying to come to terms with and which symbolic analysis does not do justice. So I'm beginning with the aesthetics here, which happen to correspond very nicely to uh, very tweaky photos of uh, the inside of uh, captive animals' heads examining neural transmission in a bunch of animals, mostly rats. But the sort of imagery, which is really chemical communication within an organism, is redolent of the sort of way that information is understood as flowing within the Yopo realm. Of course, this is not understood as being within a head. It's understood as being within a very large space. Which takes us to what I think think is a uh, big question. <laughs> is the consciousness inside your head, your body, or is it outside? Is the information coming from within, or is it coming from outside? And I think it's a false dichotomy. I think it's transcendent. But there are there is something seductively similar about the way that the aesthetics of this connect to the aesthetics of chemical cascades within your body and the idea of an ecology of relationships outside of your body and organisms which are also communicating chemically. I, I just love this dopaminergic neurons and their dendritic processes in E14 rat ventral mesocephalon neuron ganglia culture is visualized with rabbit polyclonal antisfera against tyrosine hydroxylase and the Alexa 594 conjugated goat anti rabbit eye chi chi. <laughs> Indeed, but it looks like Yopo to me. Uh, yeah. And going back to some, some, some seaborne creatures here for the, for the people from North Queensland in the house. So the idea is that this is the common message within organisms and among all, uh, among all organisms. Chemical signaling. And that the capacity for symbolic communication, which we recognize being uh, that we have as humans, has not come at the expense of capacities for chemical communication, in fact, the need for chemical communication in, multi in, in many domains. So this leaves open, as I see it, the possibility that just as chemical flows can be rearranged within a body, so too can they be renegotiated among organisms. And this is the logic of the ecology of PRO healthcare, as I understand it. If you like, it's consciousness reacting on chemical cascades that are operating among and possibly at a population level among organisms. It all fits with uh, your uh, evolutionary theories of locks and keys, chemicals and neurotransmitters. And it really maps up all too neatly with Pieroa uh, idioms, if you like, of, uh, uh, of health and, and illness. Where you have the message, uh, message from plants to herbivores carried by the allelochemicals, uh, that is, some of which are psychoactive and some of which are, are, are simply massively toxic. You eat me and I will make you ill. The message from the animals to the Pieroe, the animals are still pissed off that Wahadi took their knowledge, carried by spirits visible through a plant-chemical-human interface, you eat me and I will make you ill. It's, it's, 
all very cute. And then you break down the different types of uh, chemical signals as they're understood by chemical ecologists who separate them into three. This is just one way of looking at it. Warfare, defense, cooperation. That's a very nice triumvirate there. Communication, that's within an organism, your neurotransmission, uh, and then lifestyle behavior. <coughs> but basically, you've got sexual attractants, pheromones, predator-associated chemicals, digestible, digestibility re reducers, and toxins. Now, we can map these onto three domains, which I see as the main three domains through which we can understand Amazonian shamanism. Sex, cooperation, or, and which also, strangely enough, connects with war and predation, and food. It's food, sex, and war. These are the, uh, the, the riddles of life and uh, the cause of most disease. So then, uh, from this co-evolutionary perspective, human health is contingent on balancing interspecies relationships. This is certainly how it's understood, whereby interspecies here, we're talking about a bunch of spirits as well, but the spirits are connected to material things, although it is the non-material realm where the power is considered. And of course, and this is how I'll finish this talk in a moment, in a co-developmental sense, or in fact in any sense at all, the mind, where we're going to map the mind, can't be dissociated from webs of mind in which it emerges. Even if you want to limit that to webs of human minds. So the basic question here, how might minds change distant, unbelieving matter? <laughs> <clears throat> right, the belief thing, you know, that's the American dream. You can be anyone you want to be, you just have to believe, okay, this is a different system altogether. Uh, so these are three uh, possibly unsatisfactory explanations here. Shamans understand chemical communication flows within themselves and among species. This maps up with the mythology and the experiential data. Shamans communicate with other organisms by altering chemical cascades, which may change the nature of biosocial relationships and the matter constitutive of these. This is the negotiation, the negotiation with the animal spirits. You're negotiating a whole series of contingent relationships. Uh, or if you like, it results from consciousness reflecting on and participating in co-adaptive information flows. So, uh, firstly, going back to my original premise, explanations of the mode of action of shamanic activity uh, shamanic healthcare, which assume consciousness is reducible to a human body, are inadequate for explaining the logic of this ethnic group, the Piaroa's shamanic practice. Ritual healing and, and all of the things associated with symbolic healing as, as it's understood, which emerged from a one-to-one -one notion of consciousness and mental health, from psychotherapy and psychoanalysis, does not explain what's going on. Uh, secondly, it's the shaman and not the patient who needs to believe this system is contingent on a sufficient amount of talented and influential communicators. If you're going to be the one person who's negotiating forces in the spirit realm, <laughs> and you're the only human who can do it, you better hope that you've got a bunch of other humans on side who are making that, who are on side. So it's about collective bargaining power. Now I have uh, some some reflections on ways of approaching this similar problem. That is, 
how can you manipulate unbelieving matter? Or a way of looking at it, how would a Piroa shaman sculpt health socially? And I think, uh, so I've got three strains here, which I simply leave open as, uh, as possible parallels to the chemical ecology thesis, which is insufficient on its own. And I think this, these all come from this sort of, as my reading of uh, where uh, uh, sort of contemporary phase of psychiatric and much research on consciousness, I'm heartened to see some changes. We're in a sort of post-behaviorist, that is post one-to-one -one relationship, response, stimulus, localizing things in a body and a bit of flesh, which is if you like, we are half past materialism. I'm not sure what we have gotten into or where it goes. But many studies from different areas are leading to the idea that mind reading is, is ongoing and in fact is much more intense than we have yet understood. And it transcends our uh, ideas that mind reading is about theory of mind. That is a sort of rational one-to-one uh, relatively conscious analysis of another person's state of being, emotional being, or consciousness, or thought patterns. And this goes back, if you like, to a return to collectivist notions of consciousness. That consciousness is a fundamentally social phenomenon, which, which had been around a long time in various permutations and had taken organic form in the Western intellectual tradition, but in the 20th century reached a critical mass with philosophers and psychiatrists in the Americas and in Europe. That's, uh, yeah. The return of the conscious collective, which is Durkheim's notion of collective consciousness. Um, so I'm going to touch on these three strains here. One is morphic resonance, right? Rupert Sheldrake's idea uh, that there is a field uh, of information shared by organisms and, in fact, populations, and that that field of information regulates the behavior of those populations or that organ or anything else, which is shared by all other types within it. This is a way of understanding consciousness and information which is transcendent of it being localized within one body. And that's why I think it's relevant to understanding uh, what or how Pieroa shamans are sculpting health, if you like, conjuring, shaping social reality with their minds. That's a long quote. I'm not going to read it out. Uh, um, back to uh, then, back to uh, early 20th century, a Russian psychiatrist whose ideas I think are coming back and will be uh, provide fertile field for parallel ways of mapping social consciousness and the way that social consciousness is and can be manipulated. Or if you like, how uh, health and disease move socially and cannot be understood when one reduces it to the level of an individual or if it's, it's symptomatic manifestation in one localized body. By doing that, in fact, you totally miss the point or, th or the nature of the illness or the nature of the health. Uh, this comes from Bekhterev's idea of collective reflexology. Uh, he was um, Stalin's um, psychiatrist until Stalin killed him. Uh, I think he provided a very accurate uh, uh, diagnosis, unfortunate for Bekhterev. Uh, but he works with this idea of social contagion uh, and the connectivity among organisms, the capacity for telepathy, which he said he had experimentally proved. Uh, it's about spirit and consequence. In fact, where all subjectivity, as he understands it, is a, a, uh, an inhibition in, in flow of energy through organisms. Uh, and then finally, uh, these, a couple of ideas coming from uh, uh, a, a UK theorist, Nigel Thrift, 
who's talking about imitative rays and market-driven recursions, uh, whereby uh, the ideas, if you like, of Bekhterev and others, speaking of social contagions, uh, which have, in combination with cultural and technological innovations, which have been market-driven, are allowing for feedback onto awareness of social patterns. It's all in the interest of making money. Uh, but it's all, well, what it means is that people have an awareness of the social contagion of emotions at a degree that we have not had before. And this awareness is feeding back into the generation of the collective affective states, which is generating new collective affective states and morphing things interestingly. So I see three ways here, which all have different possible experimental lines of, of investigation which could be pursued to further understand how, if symbols aren't enough and they're not enough, part of the explanation, how Pierroa shamanism might work as a healthcare system or in fact how uh, distant unbelieving matter might be changed through minds.